Friends, Americans, countrymen, welcome to another presentation by Patrick Penry. And this particular presentation is going to center around radiation in the Pacific, specifically radiation uh, sourced from Fukushima, the Fukushima multiple meltdown disaster. And first, what I want to do is kind of go back in time and look at some Freedom of Information documents per pertaining to Fukushima from the NRC, Nuclear Regulatory Commission. And let's have a look at some evidence I found when I went and began to search by a key keyword C. And I found quite a number of references to where they had been dumping radioactive water into the ocean. So we've, you know, the admission is right here for those trolls and shills who are out there saying, no, there's no radiation in the ocean. No, it didn't go into the water. Look, here's the straight up admission I'm about to show you right now. So we can dismiss those claims right now, right off the bat to those who say, hey, there's nothing to worry about. No radiation in the water, no radiation in the Pacific. I'm going to show you evidence in this presentation to the contrary. Okay, in this first screen capture, I underlined the date. I thought it was important that I show you the sequence of dates. This is back in 2011, and this is Tuesday, March 29th, and this is from an update. And within this uh, update, you can read a number of bulletins, and the one I highlight in an underlying part from the second one. And the first one that I boxed in reads, Unit 2 trenches outside of turbine building filled with contaminated water. Trenches used for electrical or piping runs. Overflow of trenches may cause release to the ground slash C. There's that keyword I'm hunting for, C. Dose rates measured at 100 rem per hour. Wow, that's amazing. Okay, and also to be noted, I thought it was interesting, plutonium in soil. There's a, you don't see that a lot in these documents. So when I see plutonium or the one time I found mox in there, it's pretty significant to me and a significant admission. So plutonium in soil, that's also important if they're hosing these things down with these concrete pumper trucks or riot water cannons or Bechtel system or whatever it is. That's just rinsing down, washing over everything. Where is it going? Where is that going? Well, we, we have evidence right here that overflows into trenches, overflows into reservoirs, and that is it either leaks into the ocean or is directly pumped into, the purposefully released into the ocean, as we will see in these documents. Okay, we're, again, we're looking at this particular analysis that they have done. And if you look at this screen capture here, you see the nucleide analysis result for seawater samples at 330 meters south from the discharge point of units one through four. And the, the one down beneath has the sampling from 30 meters north from units five and six, which we know sustained a lot less damage than the other four units. And looking at the top chart, you can see the nucleide, iodine, or cesium, and you look in the sample concentration, the ratio, and the guideline limit. Again, this is evidence that they're testing the seawater and they are finding uh, nucleide uh, in the seawater. This next one, nucleide analysis result for seawater samples at unit two screen, very similar to the others, and just shows you again, they're sampling in the seawater and they are getting positive hits back for radioactive substances in the water. Here's another one, a nuclear analysis result for seawater samples at 15 kilometers offshore points and a date 426, and very similar to the other charts. Again, what's important here, iodine, cesium, testing offshore 15 kilometers, and they're having uh, positive results for radioactive nucleides in the seawater. Okay, here's one from April 3, Sunday, 1700 hours. Fukushima Daiichi Daily Update. Number one, major evolutions, and I have highlighted, boxed in what I thought was of major importance here. It says, on April 2nd, high-level contaminated water was found flowing out from a crack of a pit near the intake facility of Unit 2 into the sea. TEPCO tried temporary concrete pouring into the crack. However, concrete had not been solidified due to large amount of water in the pit. They are trying to dig a hole at the upstream side and inject high polymer. Now at the bottom it also says to be noted 79.4 becquerels per liter of iodine-131 was detected from the seawater sample 
taken 3 slash 30 at 40 kilometers south of Fukushima Daiichi site. It is two times of the reference level. So right at the very top, it's directly there in admission, high level contaminated water found flowing out from a crack in a pit into the sea. Whether it's intentional or unintentional, we're looking at evidence that radioactive water indeed was either dumped or accidentally leaked or went into the ocean by whatever means. Okay, here's a screen capture from the NRC for you documents. It says from Sunday, April 10th, 2011. And I boxed and read the important section that says TEPCO has confirmed that discharge of low level radioactive water in the waste processing facility of Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant into the sea was finished at 1740 today. Total amount of low level radioactive water discharge from the plant is about 10,390 tons and total radioactivity released through the discharge is about 150 billion becquerels. Also beneath that it says TEPCO is going to issue a press release on this matter soon. I've got a clip on that coming up next. But if you look at this one again, admission that this water uh, discharge of low level radioactive water into the ocean. And here's that. Here's the, what I found on that press release, the best bit of information I could find. And it'll give a date, 20, April 29th, which if you look at the previous one, Sunday 10th, okay, well, we're, you know, we're, we're look, looking a couple weeks after that. And here is their press release, and this is the uh, plethora of information they're willing to give, or at least I can find in reference to this press release. It says on April 29th, 2011, we started sampling survey of the seawater at five points in the three kilometer offshore area of Ibaraki Prefecture. Today we have conducted nucleide analysis of radioactive materials in the water sampled on April 29. We have reported the result of the analysis to NISA and the government of Ibaraki Prefecture as per attached. So we don't get a lot of information, just says analysis of radioactive materials in the water sampled. So it says they did sample radioactive materials, but the press release, or at least what we get out of the FOIA documents, doesn't really tell us a whole lot. And again, that's probably pretty close to what the real whatever came out in the newspaper on the news that night for Japan. I was like, like we all know about TEPCO. Anything that it's always downplayed or it's totally, uh, they're just totally lying about it and not telling you something. A lot of dishonesty, a lot of deception, a lot of covering up and a lot of lies coming both not just from TEPCO, but from uh, our government as well on this whole issue. Okay, this next screen capture is pretty amazing. It says marine monitoring. TEPCO is conducting a program for seawater surface sampling at a number of nearshore and offshore monitoring locations. Up until April 3, a general decreasing trend was observed at the sampling points TEPCO 1 to TEPCO 4. After the discharge of contaminated water on April 4, a temporary increase has been reported. As of April 12, no new data for TEPCO 1 through 10 sampling points have been reported. So there you go. Discharge into the ocean and they're testing for it and they're finding it there. They're finding an increase. Okay, the next screen capture says radioactive materials monitoring density of iodine 131 in the sea. Where are they monitoring in the sea? What are they monitoring for? Fission products. Iodine-131, and you can, on the left of the of this particular chart, you can see the sampling location, seacoast or offshore, and it gives you the particular distance. The date and the time, the density, and the ratio to criteria. 43 times, 40 times on some of these. So it's quite elevated, we can see. Okay, the next screen capture I have says discharge of low level radioactive accumulated water in central waste treatment facility and units five and six to the sea. Central waste disposal facility, it says in parentheses, and then says we had discharged approximately 9,070 tons of water from the discharge canal of units one to four from April 4th to April 10th. We're investigating and confirming the situation. Subdrain of Unit 5 and 6. From April 4th, we started the discharge from the water discharge canal of Units 5 and 6. And at 1852, April 9, we completed about 1,323 tons. Okay, there's more again admission right there that's being discharged and into the sea. Where is it going? Into the ocean, the Pacific Ocean. 
Okay, this next screen capture just boxed in the date because the first couple pages wasn't really relevant. And then it went into, again, evidence that it's radioactive water is being discharged into the Pacific Ocean. But note, uh, April 15th, 800 hours. And the next screen capture was the relevant section I boxed in three areas where one says discharging water in subdrain of Unit 5 to the sea, 950 meters cubed for April, April 4th, 2100 to 8 April, 1214. Those are the time hours, I guess, 2100 hours, 1214 hours. To the right of that, it says discharging water in subdrain of Unit 6 to the sea, 372.6 meters cubed for April 2100 to 9 April 1852. So this is taking place over a number of days. And to the right of that, again, draining water, concentrated RW to the sea with a directional arrow pointing towards the sea, 9,070 meters cubed from 4 April 1903 hours to 10 April 1740 hours. So it's ongoing process and quite a bit of concentrated radioactive water is being discharged into the ocean. Here's the absolute proof of it. Okay, next screen capture. Again, it's important to note the date, April 8. I just want to show you this is back in 2011. This is late March, early April, what we're looking, these analysis we're looking at here. And this particular one is a TEPCO summary. Again, you take it with a grain of salt because TEPCO has been less than honest time and time and time and time and time again. What was to note on this particular screen capture we're looking at now that I've boxed in red, I'll read you the bullets. It says, the discharge of radioactive water from the rad waste facility to the sea continues and will be completed this evening. Drainage of the units five and six underground groundwater pits will be completed on Saturday. The next bulletin says, the discharge of radioactive water from the rad waste facility to the sea continues and will be completed this evening. Following completion of pumping, workers will check the rad waste facility for cracks that might have been caused by the earthquake. And the last bulletin says the release of slightly contaminated water from units five and six groundwater pits to the sea will be completed on Saturday. Well, there's that's an intentional release, a discharge. You might could take it either way, but I see the discharges in here, evidence I see there, an intentional discharge of some of these, and we'll explain why they have to do that because of their, their temporary solution, the best solution they can come up with to try to stabilize the situation. In the long run, it's not going to be effective. We're all going to have this corium melt all the way down. Spent fuel pool number four we know was dry for quite some time. I suspect that also blob melted down. There's a sublimation through the concrete into the Taurus screen capture I have that I have difficult loading online for people to look at and it's indicative it indicates that they knew there was going to be a corium blob as well from all those bundles in number four that would melt down sublimate through the concrete and where does it end up it melts through the Taurus does it stop in the Taurus no it continues to melt down beneath so right here you see evidence of discharge of radioactive water and, to, and also we have to look at the language on this as well it's very important at the bottom it says the release of slightly contaminated water at the top it says the discharge of radioactive water so let's be sure there's a difference in that between the slightly and the radioactive and in some cases it says I, I, I think it said a couple times uh, or highly radioactive water is being concentrated I, I guess is the word being used radioactive water so this terminology is important too we're getting varying levels of radioactive water being discharged being released or leaking into the Pacific okay I'm now going to read from the Freedom of Information Act documents where these are some phone conversations between some of the NRC guys and I'll read you the box section although that's pertaining to something else what's important on these two here is the amount of water uh, they're going to be dumping onto these damaged um, critically damaged and in inoperably irreparably unsavably damaged uh, units one, two, and three, and indeed unit number four as well, which we know was not actively, uh, the plant was not running at the time, but everything had been offloaded upstairs to the spent fuel pool, which from the documents we know they knew it was dry and didn't have water for quite some time. How long? Long enough to have a absolute meltdown, absolutely, and sublimate through the concrete and go on down into the ground. Yes. Now let me read from the screen capture. Brian uh, Sharon 
says, and you know, apparently has a full core offload on there. He's talking about the spent fuel pool number four. Has a full core offload on there, you know. Is this, is it a molten mass that's starting to head into, you know, starting to interact into the concrete? John Moniker, right. We are, we are actually think the steaming is good and we've raised the concerns, you know, multiple times when the steaming stopped. You know, they're, they're at a loss what to do. They're at a loss what to do. You know, the helicopter overflights, you know, it's reported out and you go to the meetings and they say, you know, so many, not hundreds, but so many tens of tons of water have been dropped, you know, or hundreds of tons of water have been dropped. And then you look at TV and you're like, well, that cannot be like less than 10% effective due to the speed of the helicopter, the winds, etc. And they acknowledge in your, you know, so the one thing is being reported in the media that these fire trucks are going in and out, the helicopters are doing this, the super capacity pumping system, but then when you actually get down into TEPCO and start talking to the engineers, you find out that it really isn't that effective. So we, you know, in terms of, you know, that pool or even Unit 3, I mean, Unit 3 was, you know, they believe Unit 3 was, you know, they believe Unit 3 was dry. And it was multiple days before, you know, they got those, even those first fire trucks in. So that's why they put their priority on Unit 3. And they believe they had some time on Unit 4. They had moved some, some equipment over to Unit 4. I just, you know, so they are working both Unit 3 and Unit 4. But, you know, we've pushed on very significantly to, you know, and it goes on from there. And what we see here clearly is these indication that the helicopters and the super capacity pumping trucks that TEPCO rolls out. Number one, they're, they're late to get there. They can't arrive immediately because you have to bulldoze, clear the way you have to bulldoze to drop the shine down, actually covering radioactive debris to drop down the radioactivity before workers can go in. The doses were lethal initially. Uh, uh, lethal By lethal, I mean you wouldn't last very long. It wouldn't be months or years. It would be a, a fair short order. You would have serious problems. Now, uh, again to note here the while there's a lot of water being dumped on these things it's not that effective it may just be for show and I want you to know and to see from these documents that that you know that is their solution is these pumper trucks the helicopter drops the Bechtel pumps and the end you look at it it's like straining at a, a giant massive beast and all you have is a little tiny toothpick to do battle with them. It's the best thing they could come up with. Again, all this water that's being sprayed and poured and dumped, where does it go? It leaks into these pits. These pits are drained. These pits are discharged. This has been an ongoing process. Now, at the point where the fuel, the corium blobs melt down beneath the torses into the ground and down into groundwater underneath the bay and what have you, you know, then it's a, even it's un, unreachable. There's nothing more you can do about it at that point. And this is what I'm being told indeed is exactly happening right now in Japan. Okay, this screen capture here, this next one shows us water sprays to Unit 3 having little or no impact. I wanted to show you that in these documents, and there's plenty more references to this, that the water dumps, the sprays from the concrete pumper trucks are having little to no effect. And the NRC is, is very well aware of that. They're also well aware of how long it takes to get in and even begin to try that ineffective little, you know, uh, uh, straining, swatting at this giant dragon. It's not doing a, a whole lot of good. Okay, a couple more things I want to read you, and these two have to do, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, okay, correct, it will go into the some kind of amount of the water that they're spraying. I want to give you an idea how much you're just spraying over all this radioactive material, blobs, broken bits of debris, fuel pellets all over the ground, the shine so heavy they're having to bulldoze stuff over to drop it back for workers to go and this is all being just sprayed with this mess of water that's trickling down into pits trickling into the ocean you need to know that John Moniger says and also the the helicopters all those systems are really not highly effective or actually just marginally effective and you know the problem is I mean we're shooting from so far away you have incredible losses Brian Sharon right I mean just with that powdering the dropout etc so that's so that's all that. So yes, we've been concerned with Unit 4 all along. I think Unit 4 is the one we got in a little bit of trouble with. Okay, right there's evidence marginally effective. 
not highly effective. They're describing the helicopters. They're describing the pumper trucks. It's it, a lot of it is for show. A lot of it is for show. I think I even wrote an article. I discussed that on one where they the NRC looked at TEPCO and said, "Look, they're basing a decision on a response to the disaster, one particular aspect of it, on the fact that CNN and these other." news outlets may be watching them and they don't and some things like if they respond a certain way and that's seen on television it might look really bad for them and for nuclear power so they're make, basing their decisions on what's going to be publicized how they're going to respond right that's incredible and so it looks to me like the response was just make it look good just make it look good in the eyes of the whatever media is going to be allowed to carry this and promote this we want it to look like we're spraying it and dousing water on it and everything's under control and stabilized that's nothing could be further from the truth okay the next screen capture they're going to actually talk about gallons per minute uh john moniker says yeah yeah the engineering drawing yeah I'm talking about a spec sheet. I'm going to show you that in a minute. You'll get to look at the Bechtel, uh, the specs for the Bechtel pumping trucks and th that whole scheme. It says, yeah, yeah, the engineering drawing, yeah, we had that out. We have shared that with them, etc. But they, when they came to us, you know, today in the meeting with TEPCO, they said they're talking, you know, this boom truck, boom truck, 58 meters. Well, what happened is they, you know, they were like, can this shoot up 50 meters versus 58? I said, well, yeah, it's no big deal. I said, we'll, we'll check into it. But the design specs for the water cannons were 50 meters high, and I think 100 meters out with 500 gallons per minute. I said, you know, if you're not telling us the 58, we think we'll be able to throttle the nozzle down to reach the 58 meters. We'll have Bechtel and I'll run it down. But you may not get 500 gallons per minute in there. But we said, we threw a margin in there anyway and said we didn't think it was an issue okay and that's the important part you need to see in this particular one is that they're discussing a number 500 gallons per minute you might not quite get that much he says I have to throttle down to try and get a little more distance because we we can't get that close sometimes it's the incredible lethal dose rates in the shine they cannot this is clear in the documents now they can't get close to it but the trolls and the shills and apologists saying it wasn't that bad there and it was a hoax and it's nothing really big going on hey in these documents mm -mm, mm -mm, total opposite of that to be noted here 500 gallons per minute 500 gallons per minute. Where does that water go? Where, and that's con that has to be constant. And it's it's how effective is it? How effective is it? By the time the Bechtel pumps are brought in, it's weeks and weeks have passed. Weeks and weeks have passed. And they know it's days and days before the Japanese can even get their crappy little concrete pumper trucks in. And so if you look at the NUREG manuals, N-U-R-E-G, according to what I see and read about them, in there they spell out specifically, if you're in a station blackout, i.e., in other words, without power at this nuclear power plant, Mark 1 containment, for X number of hours, you are going to have a meltdown. If you don't restore some kind of cooling, eventually they know the time limit it takes for this to happen. It's pretty specific under specific circumstances. That corium blob is going to melt to 5,000 degrees approximately. That's my understanding, again, as a layman trying to you know, uh, do away with my ignorance. It's superheated when it's no longer cooled, okay? And that melts down through all of the metal uh, workings of the torus and what have you of the reactor, and it's called the China syndromes. And my understanding, in Three Mile, they were able to restore some kind of cooling. So when they had a partial top melt, the blob froze at the bottom of containment once they were able to restore cooling to some degree. Again, that's my crude understanding of Three Mile. So the blob stopped before it went all the way through the containment and came out underneath, wherein you can't really circulate water inside that containment if the blob's outside of that, right? The blob's 20 feet down in the ground underneath your reactor building. You can only pour water on it, hope it drains down through the cracks. If it's 50 feet down, you can only try and pour water down. Now the blob is melting through and creating these glass-like tubes, like a lava tube. And what water they're spraying on is pouring down these lava tubes onto the blob. And what do we have? A massive radiation release into the atmosphere and into the Pacific. And Obama wants to build three new nuclear power plants. Right? Okay. And this next screen capture here, I promised I would show you. This is the Bechtel scheme scam pumping truck thing. And in the end, we pumping trucks, we paid around 9.8 billion. 
the John Q. Taxpayer footed the bill for the pumps for these Bechtel pumps. And this is the little system you can see it requires. If you look at the schematic, you have to drop a submersible pump into the ocean gets up off the floor, it's got some kind of filters and it's sucking in this vast amount of water out of the ocean. There's a submersible pump there. Okay, that is then pumped up to your initial truck. You have a flatbed truck with this another giant pump in the back of the truck, a secondary pump that grabs it and pumps it on up to another truck where there's a tertiary pump on that truck and that pumps it up the boom and out the, the nozzle onto the reactor building. Again, when the top of the reactor building collapses on the spent fuel pool and in the documents they mention this, it's very difficult to get the water in to cool the spent fuel even if it's still there and hadn't melted on down because there's inches of concrete and what have you on top of it literally blocking the water from falling down on it, cascading down on it. Now it's running off the side and spilling over the side. Again, how effective was this? Our, our fair, we're fairly certain now that we have a multiple China syndrome and that the, these corium blobs, they couldn't get there in time. And this is obvious. If you know nuclear power, if you know the NEREG manual, and all these guys know it. They, all the academia, all the professionals, they know that there's X number of hours you have to get in there and restore cooling, just like at Three Mile. And if you're not in there in that period of window of opportunity, you then you have this superheated, melted mass of radioactive a blob, this corium a melt through, and it's, it's so hot, it burns, it sublimates through anything and everything. E, like I say, even leaving these glass-like lava tubes behind as it melts down through the ground, and where does it stop? That's a good question. That's why it's called the China Syndrome, because they like to joke around and melt right through the earth and come out the other side and where they say China is, although China is, on the, is not on the other side of the United States, but... A lot of people seem to think it is. So have a good look at this schematic. This was their, this was the solution. This was how they were going to save the day. And in fact, they never saved the day. It was pretty much a total loss from day one. Uh, NRC and our boys knew, knew it early on just how damn serious it was going to be because of the station blackout, because tsunami destroyed equipment, inundated electrical components with salt water control panels, everything. So they knew there was no quick chance to get cooling back, and they knew it that was going to mean because they say they knew everything about Chernobyl. Now, I don't want to get distracted because I also want to go in and let's have a look. And again, this this abstract I picked up from Kevin Blanche. He has a video on this as well. But I want to read you this one particular abstract and I'll include the link to there's like 10 or 11 or 12 little studies that have been done. But this one was the one that seemed the most serious and alarming. So this is the one I wanted to read to you. As I prioritize in the most serious stuff, I try to get out first. And it's titled Cesium Iodine and Tritium in Northwest Pacific Waters, a Comparison of the Fukushima Impact with Global Fallout. Okay, we want to note in here that this these samples were collected in June of 2011. So after what we just talked about in these FOIA documents during March and April, then come in June, there's some uh, samples being collected, and here's the abstract, the results of those analysis. It says radionuclide impact of the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant accident on the distribution of radionuclides in seawater of the Northwest Pacific Ocean is compared with global fallout from atmospheric tests of nuclear weapons. Surface and water column seawater samples collected during the international expedition in June 2011 were analyzed for cesium-134, cesium-137, iodine-129, H3, and that's tritium. The cesium-137 and iodine-129 and H3 levels in surface seawater offshore Fukushima varied between 0.002 to 3.5 becquerels per liter to the power of negative 1, 0.01 to 0.8 micro becquerels per liter to the power of negative 1, and 0.5 to 0.15 becquerels per liter to the power of negative 1, respectively. At the sampling site of about 40 kilometers from the coast, where all three radionuclides were analyzed, the Fukushima impact on the levels of these three radionuclides represent an increase above the global fallout background by factors of about 1,000, 30, and 3, respectively. That would be factors of about 1,000 for the cesium-134, factors of about 30 for the cesium-137, 
I'm sorry, for the iodine-129 and factors of about 3 for the tritium, the H3. The water column data indicate that the transport of Fukushima-derived radionuclides downward to the depth of 300 meters has already occurred. The observed cesium-137 levels in surface waters and in the water column are in reasonable agreement with predictions obtained from the ocean general circulation model which indicates that the radionuclides have been transported from the Fukushima coast eastward. The cesium-137 inventory in the water column, parentheses, the area from 34 to 37 degrees north and from 142 to 147 degrees east, close parentheses, due to the Fukushima accident is estimated to be about 2.2 pico becquerels. The amount of iodine-129 and H3 released and deposited on the Northwest Pacific Ocean after the Fukushima accident was estimated to be about 7 gigabecquerels and 0.1 picobecquerels respectively. Due to a suitable resonance time in the ocean, Fukushima-derived radionuclides will provide useful tracers for isotope oceanography studies on the transport of water masses in the Northwest Pacific Ocean. And what's crucial to be noted again, it, we are testing for it by factors of 1,000, 30, and 3 times what we're, they're seeing in the atmospheric test for nuclear weapons. So is it elevated? Yes. Are they testing for it and finding it? Yes. Is it in the Pacific? Yes. How far down is it? Down to the depth of 300 meters. Again, what's missing in a lot of these tests, I don't see anyone checking for plutonium. And that seems to be a red flag for me. Why are they not testing for plutonium? Is there a reason for them not to test for plutonium? Okay, let's see. We covered the FOIA documents. And then we covered that particular abstract where they have tested for in the Northwest Pacific up to 300 meters down. The radioactive iodine, cesium, and tritium. And the last thing I want to cover on this particular broadcast if that's what you want to call it. Uh, I want to go on and look at what the recent news that just came out today that's prompted me to get off my butt and really get on this and get this out here because it's important you you have this information and you can judge for yourself how you feel about nuclear power and not just listen to Obama and Mitt Romney telling you it's you know clean emission free a wonderful way to produce electricity. So let's have a look at the article from the 8th of July. This is one on e, &E News. I'm, you know, I like the threads in e, &E News. And I like the people in the comments in the threads of e, &E News. And if you read those threads are even more important than the article itself because in those threads explain if the article's propaganda, what part might be disinformation, what is inaccurate. And, and right now it seems in the threads are kind of run and controlled by the public at large. Like I said in a video I posted on YouTube earlier today, my mom goes into e, e News and logs in and makes comments all the times and finds her comments are deleted. So the humans that come in there in the threads, by and large, are good people keeping the trolls at bay. But whoever's controlling e, e News in the background can go and delete your comment. And so I've been very clear on this on a number of instances. There's a couple places that will talk about the disaster, even mentioning FOIA documents and give some good information. But it's still, by and large, low level when you look at the act, you know, the the worst of the worst and the true reality that's going on. There's better Best we can determine it with a lack of information in the media blackout and so on and so forth. They're way downplaying it. They look at superficial issues, a lot of disinformation, a lot of propaganda. So check the threads and the people inside these threads by and large are really good people. And if a troll goes in there, they pretty much get called out pretty soon. And this one is titled, this is from the Wall Street Journal. Again, like I say, mainstream a media outlet so to take it with a grain of salt and in the threads in here again like I say they point out hey they give you a little bit of good information but they downplay the whole overall size and magnitude of the disaster and that's what they're doing it's carefully downplaying damage mitigation so the Wall Street Journal says soaring radioactivity levels on coast of Fukushima plant nuclear material may have leached from melted fuel cores and into the environment from July, July 8, 2013, more than two years after the devastating accident at Japan's Fukushima Daiichi nuclear plant, 
operator, and that would be TEPCO, is seeing levels soar of a radioactive element called tritium. The problem spot is on the coastal side of the plant's heavily damaged number two reactor one of the areas where TEPCO regularly monitors groundwater to check for radioactive elements that may have leached from the plant's partly melted fuel course and into the environment. Okay, and from another article from the GG Press, July 8, 2013, Tokyo Electric Power Company says 2,300 becquerels per liter of tritium was found in seawater sampled off its crippled Fukushima No. 1 nuclear power station Wednesday, the highest level recorded since the March 2011 accident. It is feared that groundwater containing high levels of tritium may be leaking into the sea from the plant's No. 2 reactor building. Well, again, I showed you previous documentation where we know for sure it's been discharged, it's leaked, you know, they purposefully vented into the ocean for any number of reasons. We know this is a fact. These guys like to phrase it in the form of it is feared that it may be. Well, we know they dumped it. We know they discharged it in the story. This is, and that was old school back in 2011. So what we're worried about now and what this shows now, again, that's why I showed you the initial pouring of water on. Okay, that's one thing. But now what we're looking at is if that would have been effective at some point the fission would have stopped we, we can agree on that and these particular byproducts of this fission like cesium-134 you it, it wouldn't be as such abundance and then as time goes on and it, it, it approaches its half-life you would see the strength of it and the amount of it would begin to decrease right now that's just simple physics when you think about it and again this is on based on if you're able to cool re-establish cooling to the to the core to the control to the fuel rods and everything right and if you're not unable to do that it continues to sublimate and melt down through the ground into the groundwater underneath the bay as the comment i read on my video today from e, &E news pretty much spelled it out in a in an excellent uh, picture let me see if i can find this one here i'll read it to you it says what are the sources of the radiation contaminating the pacific ocean question mark Cooling water is dumped into the unit 1, 2, and 3 reactor runs to cool fuel splatter left behind. This water flows out the bottom of containments 1, 2, and 3 into groundwater and also out of torus basements. Groundwater flows through corium lava tubes left by the passage of corium 1, 2, and 3. Corium is a melted fuel rod, this blob of melted superheated material. Corium 1, 2, and 3 melted down into the mud rock then out under the Pacific Ocean, following layers in the mud rock. As Corium 1, 2, and 3 melted under the harbor and ocean floor, radioactive steam and water flowed up through cracks in the seabed and into the ocean. And this again rings true with I've, these reports I've heard about cracks and steam coming up. This is, and if you, you realize at the time in these four year documents that we know they were unable to respond, unable to restore power to come in with this half ass attempt with a concrete pumper trucks and a helicopter a dumps. Wow, it was the worst case scenario and all those melted through containment. The NUREG manual tells you that they know they've, they've purposefully let reactors melt down, many of them, many of them to study and know just how long it takes in one of these events. It goes on to say, who will be affected? Millions of fishermen, including employees on factory ships, will no longer find customers for their fish, so on and so forth. There's going to be a major effect in this particular the Pacific Ocean, and that's huge. That is huge revenue, huge income, and a huge food source. And again, what does Obama do? They raise the radiation limits. That's their solution. Build more nuclear plants, raise the radiation limits, and turn your back and ignore what's in the FOIA documents about this massive multi-agency cover-up. I mean, all these agencies are corrupt. They're all participating in this. We're getting slammed 1.3 million Americans. That's a conservative estimate to be dead from Fukushima by the year 2030. Hey, do you like nuclear power? 1.3 million Americans dead. Conservative, conservative estimate. Now let me go to my last a bit of this report and I want to cover what came out today on the 9th of July. Again, this is from e, &E News to be I warn you, be careful. Watch some of the guys like Sick Pewter or good people in these threads and a number, I can't remember all their names right now. My mom's in there somewhere wandering around as well. So keep in mind that in the threads, these guys like Sick Pewter, my mom knows they're really good people. You get good information from them. They call out the trolls when the trolls show up. Okay, but the overall 
I would do E&E &E News differently. I mean, really, they could have highlighted for you documents. They could have really concentrated on the worst of the worst and made it easy for us to access some of these documents and information and what have you. And I, I don't find it to be so. Now, that to the side, though, however, I am going to report on you know, I find them, I find other places to be a lot worse. I'll put it that way. It does get worse than E&E &E News by a long shot. You got Alex Jones and Infowars, right? Okay, I rest my case. Officials report, quote unquote, troubling discovery at Fukushima nuclear plant. CCM levels rocket 9,000% over three days in groundwater. TEPCO, quote unquote, can't explain it. For a particular video from NHK World, July 9th, 2013, quote, Officials at Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant say they've made a troubling discovery. Cesium levels soar in Fukushima plant groundwater. On Monday, TEPCO recorded 9,000 becquerels of cesium-134 and 18,000 becquerels of cesium-137 per liter of water at a well between the number two reactor building and the sea. Both radioactive substances were up about 90 times from the level logged three days ago. TEPCO officials say they do not know why cesium levels have risen suddenly or what effect the spike is having on the nearby ocean. Okay, here's another one from the Asahi Shimbun. That's another news agency, Japanese news agency. Tokyo Electric Power Company said radioactive cesium levels in a well at the Fukushima number no. one nuclear power plant on July 8 were 90 times higher than those measured at the same site just three days earlier. TEPCO said July 9 that cesium levels of 27,000 becquerels per liter, the highest cesium levels found since the onset of the March 2011 nuclear disaster, were detected in water samples a day earlier from a well on the seaward side of the number two reactor building. We do not know why only cesium levels have risen, quote unquote, a TEPCO official said. And there's another section from the AFP in here and the Wall Street Journal as well and to be noted in this what's important here and what I'm being told again I'm not an expert but these are byproducts of fission and for these to be occurring in these amounts this length of time from the initial disaster I am being told that this is indicative of this particular China syndrome it's down into the melted in through the dirt down into the ground and it's down there just doing its thing it's gonna get this is gonna be ongoing it's not over it's ongoing unlike Chernobyl the action was not taken like the Russians did I mean that the big difference between these two incidents not just the size and scope Japan is much worse but the lack of any viable solution right off the bat if you look at what the Russians did the the steps they took and, and then if you look in Fukushima at these Bechtel pumps and just to spray water on that kind of thing it seems to me that they didn't really have a solution or they were unwilling or unable to implement anything that really would have been to the level of what we see at Chernobyl digging underneath coming up underneath covering it with lead on the top the whole thing they lost a lot of people to do it but in the end did it save a higher you know, us from a higher body count fatality count and more long-term injuries like the mutations and the deformations and so on and so forth we have to believe so with Chernobyl that the Russians did a brave thing sacrificed a lot of lives the needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few remember Dr. Spock saying that in the Wrath of Khan or whichever Star Trek movie that's how the Russians looked at it now Fukushima you know I just when people talk about depopulation events and stuff I say well I didn't see any real move to really try to do something about Fukushima it's almost like they wanted to let us get blasted with the radiation and try to downplay it and conceal it and hide it and let us take the brunt of it and hoping we don't notice or something I don't know guys right okay so this is basically the end of my report here I just wanted to uh, give you some insight into the FOIA documents again pertaining to this dump of radioactive water into the sea we know it's happened we know it's happened and then now you know years later what I showed you before was from right after the incident now years later having the same kind of uh, byproducts of fission being discovered in the wells and off the uh, coast of Fukushima so that is indicative to us of, of ongoing fission the corium blobs are still reacting melting down it's ongoing right and with no end in sight Okay, and that's in the presentation. Thank you very much for listening to this. And again, everyone who's talking about the situation in Japan, and especially those FOIA documents that reveal this massive, huge cover-up and why we're 
all going to get blasted and lose 1.3 million Americans because they covered up no precautions, no rainwater warnings. They raised the limits of the rainwater. They rigged the RADnet monitors. Wow. Wow is all I can say. Okay, Patrick Penry, thanks for joining me. Over and out. We need to get subscribed and get this unity stronger and beat YouTube at their own game. Okay, that's what this is about. Like I say, go to the Remix button, hit the Remix button. That way you'll have this video and, and keep up with this. Otherwise, you know, YouTube's just going to control us, guys, and it's, it's really...